as we talk about Christian life with a theme of back to basics, that we want to re-examine our Christian walk and concentrate on basic things, as we want to abide in His first love, and also we want to be faithful in everything that God has entrusted upon our care. And today, as we continue on on the series of Back to the Basics, that we want to look at our trying God. The terminology Trinity is not found in the Bible, but we know the concept because throughout the entire scriptures, we understand, yes, we do have only one God, but He is the trying God. We have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And most of us, we do understand this concept, even though this is a very mysterious and it's impossible on this earth with a human linguistic expression to fully be able to understand our trying God and Trinity. But also, there's a different aspect to this Trinity. Why? Because our God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, they have a perfect unison and unity, and they enjoy complete, perfect intimacy to each other. And that's something we don't think that much. But because our God is so intimate in their love to each other, and God, when He designed us, and we became object of His love, and His desire is for every one of us, and His passion, His love has no bounds, and He pursues after our heart, and He loves us so much, and He wants us to enjoy this intimacy with Him. Whether how old we are, it doesn't matter whether young or old, how busy we are, how important the people we might be in our society, every one of us, we are called to pursue after His intimacy. We are to pursue His intimacy in our everyday life. And that is such basic in our life. Love and God's love is all over the place. And it's unending, unaltering, unchanging, and so abundant and readily available for those who seek His face and His love. So today, we are going to Go to Book of Song of Solomon. And I don't think I ever once on Sunday have preached from any verse from this passage. This is a love between King Solomon and woman. It's called a Solomite woman. And she becomes her, his bride. And their expressive love is so astounding. It's so visual and sensual as well. Not only it has a, a spiritual connotations and symbolically it describes such a great love between Christ and His church, who is His bride, but also in the physical realm. And it's so poetic. And I remember when I sat down once and really dig into this book and meditate upon it and I couldn't help myself with becoming blessing. It's so in detail. Let me put it that way. <laughs> That's why Jewish parents will not allow their children to read this book until they become 30 years old. But some of us are not 30 years old in our congregation, but let's read this. Let's turn our Bible to Song of Solomon, so chapter 7, from verse 1 through 11. And let us alternate this. I'm so sorry. Um, King Solomon is expressing his uh, abounding love to his bride, to Solomon, woman, uh, from verse 1 through verse 9, then 10 and 11 is responding expression of this woman to his groom, her groom. 
but my voice doesn't do the uh, mood here. But you yourself <laughs> invite the Holy Spirit <laughs> to fully be able to understand this. But let us read this. A song of Song, uh, or Song of Solomon. How beautiful are you, your feet in sandals, O oh, prince's daughter. The curves of your thighs are like jewels. The work of hands of a skillful, skillful workman. Your navel is a rounded goblet. It lacks no blended beverage. Your waist is a heap of wheat set about with lilies. Your two breasts are like a two fawns, twins of gazelle. Your neck is like an ivory tower. Your eyes like the pools in Heshbon. By the gate of Bath Rebbin, your nose is like the Tower of Lebanon, which looks toward Damascus. Your head crowns you like a mountain carmel. The hairs of your head is like a purple. A king is held captive by your tresses. How fair and how pleasant you are, O oh love, with your delight. This stature of yours is like a palm tree, and your breasts like its clusters. I said, I will go up to the palm tree. I will take hold of its branches. Let now your breasts be like clusters of the vine, the fragrance of your breath like apples. And the roof of your mouth like the best wine. The wine goes down smoothly for my beloved, moving gently the lips of slippers. I am my beloved's, and his desire is toward me. Eleven all together. Come, my beloved, let us go forth to the field. Let us lodge in the villages. How King Solomon is so deeply in love with these women, and he is describing his desire toward this woman. And this woman replies and says, I am my beloved's beloved. <laughs> And his desire is towards me. Now, from I like to highlight on the verse 10, because this should be my response to my God. How much God loves me and as a groom, because he oftentimes describes the relationship between him and his Israelites, that he was the husband and also Israel was his bride. And in this relationship, the wife is responding to her husband's love and say, I am my beloved, and his desire is towards me. Now, this expression has repeated throughout the Song of Solomon. And first, it's chapter 2, verse 6, and it's the same way it says, Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 16, My beloved is mine, and I am his and he feeds his flock among the lilies. So there is a sense of belonging to each other. And when we want to fully understand and enjoy love for each other, we must belong to each other. We must be able to say this between the husband and wife. And as if in the book of Genesis, chapter, chapter 3, verse 16, it, here God, as a verdict to the women, he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain, you shall bring forth the children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Your desire as wife will be upon your husband. And as long as you are wife, you will pursue his love, and your desire will be resting upon him and all your life everything will revolve around his love and that's a verdict and that's how the wives love their husband but on the other way because it is conjugal expression of love and she says the bride says i am my beloved and his desire is towards me in responding to his love, she says, I am yours, and he is mine. And how can I say, I know my God is the king, and my God is the creator, and my God is a perfectly holy and righteous God, and to him, and I say, you are mine. 
And God says, also, you are mine, that I am his, and his love and his desire is toward me. And also, there was another uh, chapter, chapter 6, verse 3, and it's the same expression. I am my beloved's. And my beloved is mine. And he feeds his flock among the lilies. So to understand our relationship with our God and to fully experience his love, that I must belong to him and he belongs to me. And this is a very possessive love. And between the husband and wife, we have an exclusive and private relationship. No one can interject. No one can intervene in this relationship as we enjoy love for each other. And we have this sense of belonging to it. Once a certain pastor went to mission field, and as he was returning back from the mission field in the airplane that was newlywed going to honeymoon, and the wife said, Honey, I am yours. And he couldn't help himself overhearing their conversation. And husband says, you are mine and I'm yours. And as a pastor, he had to be politically right. And he couldn't help himself saying to him, no, she is God's and you are also God's. No, you don't own to each other kind of thing. But as we love and as we fall in love with even human soul, we say, I am yours. I am, my heart is sold out exclusively only to you. And my love, my desire is only available for you. And our God expresses his love towards every one of us. Now, that as a human, it's not easy to understand. Why? Polygamy is prohibited by our God. As a man, I cannot love more than one woman. It's impossible. But historically and also even present, present era, Muslims, they do have multiple wives. But his love for all four women cannot be seen. It's impossible. Our hum human heart is not designed that way. If I am in love with a one woman and that love cannot be shared with the other women, it's impossible. So polygamy is a prohibited. It's only to satisfy sexual lust for men. And women become object. And that relationship cannot exist in human. However, with God, it's possible. Our God, when he decides to love me, his love for me is so exclusive and so private. He loves me as if there's no one existing on the face of earth except me. And that's how much he's omnipotent and omnipresent. And to me, he can be available solely. And I don't need to be jealous because he loves other souls. And that's how much his mind is undivided to every one of us. You and I, his love, his pursuit for my heart is undivided unaltering, unchanging, and it's eternal. And it's so overwhelming to know, and his desire is toward me. His desire is for me. His desire is so strong for me. In a way, I like to make this a statement, paradoxical statement to me. That is, there's an idol in the heart of our God. His love for me is so strong, I become his idol. Not in a way that he worships me, but because his desire and his love and his passion for me is so great, inside of God's heart, I become his idol. To a point, remember Israelites, when they worship the idols, they will allow their children go through the fire and offer them as a sacrifice. And it's abomination before God, even before human souls. But in such a way that I became his idol, and his love is so passionate with a flame 
And in a such absurd way, he loves me. He will let his only son, Jesus, go through the fire of the crucifixion and offer him as a sacrifice to love me, to help me, and to own my heart and to seize me with his passion. And I am an idol before him. And his desire is in such a way toward me. And the scripture, all over the places, we can understand his desire is toward me and for me. You know, recently as I was reading 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 and 18, all of us commemorate this. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing. Give thanks in everything, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. And we memorize that. And whenever I read, there's a certain pressure and burden in my sh on my shoulder. Why? How can I rejoice always? How can I rejoice always when I suffer, when I am in pain, when people ridicule me and persecute me, and they are still emotionally, how can I rejoice it? There's a burden upon my shoulder. But recently, I realized there's a different dimension to these verse, verses. Why? Because it describes God's heart, that His heart and His desire is for me. His desire is toward me. Why? As a groom, He's my husband. And husband's desire for his wife is always to rejoice and always be happy and be satisfied because of his love. And that's why my most frequent question to my wife is, honey, are you happy? Because if we are good husbands, our desire, natural desire for our wives will be to make sure that she is happy, to make sure she is happy living and dwell with me. And in such a way, his desire is toward me. And he boldly says to me, my bride, my church, my soul, my desire, rejoice always. I want you to be happy all the time. And then he says, pray without ceasing. How can I? I easily become busy-minded. And I have a responsibility. And I, my heart drifts away. My mind is full of concerns and worries all the time. And how do you demand me to pray to you without ceasing? And this also, in another retrospect, his desire towards me. And he wants to commune with me all the time without alteration, without stop. Without any break, pray to me, converse with me, commune with me, talk to me, my darling, all the time without ceasing. And that's God's heart, His desire for me is to commune with me without any interruption. Without ceasing, pray, come and converse with me. And what about giving thanks in everything? Not only am I your husband, not only do I love you, but I am all-powerful. No matter what circumstance you may go through, no matter how suffering, suffocating your situation might become, trust me, rely upon me, give thanks in everything. My heart will never, never cease to love you. Trust me. I am all-powerful. I can rescue you. There's a reason why. You go through this tunnel. Give thanks in everything. That's just one example. But through the scriptures, how about it? as we understand the Holy Spirit, as we read the book of Exodus, that we find God asking Moses to kill the lamb and with that blood painted upon the lintel and two doorposts so that angel of the death may pass over to rescue your people. However, in New Testament, it goes, the story goes in another way. That he kills the Lamb of God, his only son, Jesus, on the cross, and his blood has been painted upon my lintel of my heart and two doorposts. 
And instead of angel of the Lord, angel of the death, bypassing it or passing over it, angel of life, which is the Holy Spirit, gushes into my heart and dwells in me 24-7 and has a seal in my heart. No matter what, no matter how many times I grieve him, he will never depart from me. And God's desire is toward me. And it's so overwhelming. Not only that, Jesus says to us, in remembrance of me, take this bread, which is my body, and drink this wine, which is my blood. He wants to encounter me in such a tangible, physical way because way he knows I am a mere body. And he says, I will come to you in the bodily form as a bread, that I love you so much, my desire is, is such an absurd way. You can eat my body, and as a piece of my body goes into your stomach, and that's how I want to become your portion. That's how much my desire is unending. And the blood runs in my vein. It sounds so cannibal. But that's how much his desire is toward me. Then this woman repl replies on verse 11, Come, my beloved. She's saying to her groom, Let us go forth to the field and let us lodge in the villages. As we go back to the basics, as we are the beloved, we need to pursue after the intimacy. We need to chase after his intimate love. As long as we know his desire is for me and his love is so exclusive, so private, and so obsessive and possessive towards me, and I, my heart, I make it available to that love. And I respond it by pursuing intimacy with him. And fully making my heart available for their love. And how can I do that? First is making covenant. Because my loving relationship with my God is covenantal. Can you imagine when you are married, you say to your wife, you know, I'm just only in our name, husband. I'm just here for two years. Let's assign the contract for five years. Can we imagine any loving relationship be built within a period for five years, then afterwards we'll be separated? No, even human conjugal relationship is a perpetual. And only death can separate them. And from that foundation, we can build a strong love. We own to each other. I am yours and you are mine. And this is exclusive. And no one can intervene, not even our children. Just like that, when God made decision, throughout the entire scriptures, he says, I make a covenant with you. He said it to Noah, to Abraham, I make a covenant with you. To Jacob, I make a covenant with you. To Israelites, he says, you are my people, and I make this covenant with you. And in New Testament era, Jesus said, by his blood, this is a new covenant I make with you. I will perpetually love you, and you are mine, and I am yours. So as we make this covenant with our God, as we pursue the intimacy with him, this is undivided covenant and wholesome exclusive covenant that I make with him and this is eternal and this is unchanging there's no expiry date no termination date and I am fully given to him and even though that I begin this walk intimate work walk with Jesus for eternity but I give my time because he's fully available all the time. Some people say, some parents trying to make an excuse to their children. They say, you know, quality time is more important than quantity time. 
But let's not deceive ourselves. Without quantity, there cannot be quality. That we need to dwell in His presence. We need to sit down at His feet and converse and enjoy His presence and His passion. And it starts now for forever. And that's a covenant that we need to make. And second way that we can pursue intimacy with our beloved is being transparent. Because our God is a transparent. When we read this Song of Solomon, we can see how our God, with His emotion, He doesn't hide. He's fully expressive. He's fully expressive of His anger, His agony, His grief, and His love and His joy over us. And He can be so sensual in the book of Song of Solomon. And His wrath is so great against the Canaanites. And He says, destroy all the breathing animals and the people, including women with the children. And he doesn't hide that. Oh, this is too much for them. No. He's fully transparent. As much as a human can understand his nature, he doesn't hide. Except when it is detrimental to us. He says, the last day, even only Father knows. Because when we know the dead end, our life will be miserable. And other than that, he's fully transparent. He doesn't hide his He doesn't hide his nature. He doesn't hide his plan. He reveals them to his prophets first. No longer you are my servant. You are my friend. And I lay down my life for my friend. As he's transparent, as we Respond to his love. We must also become transparent. By nature, we are not. By nature, we have a hard time being transparent to each other. We always put a mask. Why? Because after the fall, our ancestors, Adam and Eve, the very first thing they did after they have fallen into sin was hiding themselves with the leaves. And that's our nature. That's our tendency. And even though I'm suffering, I'm bleeding inside of my heart. And before man, I say, it's okay. And with that attitude, I come before God. God, holy God, righteous God. And we want to be politically correct. But God knows everything. What's going on in my heart? Cognitively, in my head, I know every thought, my meditation, Words of my mouth are ascending into the heavenly throne. Logically, I understand that. But emotionally and with my heart, when I come before God, we close it up and we cover it. And we have a hard time being transparent. But as a lover, he wants to be there when I rejoice. And he wants to share tears together when I suffer. Sorrow and joy. The lover wants to commune together. But us, he becomes last table and counseling table that we want to go to. And when we go to, we cover with our mask. We need to learn to be transparent with our emotion, with our intention, with our motivation, with our heart. And without transparency, there cannot be intimacy. It's the same with the couples. Without transparency, when there is a secret between two, there cannot be strong bond. Only transparency induces intimacy. And then thirdly, the way we pursue intimacy with him is to know him. In Hebrew, yada, know God. It's a so exhaustive, descriptive verb. It's not just a cognitively, intellectually, you know something. It's not about we memorize a few verses. They are important because they are weapons, spiritual weapons. But to know him, yada, it also has a connotation as a husband carnally knowing his wife. 
That's how much. It takes our emotion. It takes our knowledge. It takes our soul. It takes our efforts. It takes our research. Everything invested it into to know him. Because knowing has a different degree. The way I know my wife, the way I know President Omaba, the way I say I love you when I go to India to local nationals whom I recently met, Yes, in Christ Jesus, I can decide to love them. But my love for the flock God has entrusted me, my love for my church member and the local nationals in India is quite different because I know their past. I know their struggles. I know their flaws. And I know their failures. And I know what they go through. And heart to heart, I know them. And in such a way, I love them. So God is beating us to know him because he knows already. He knows us already. In the book of John chapter 10, verse 14 and 15, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd and I know my sheep and am known by my own. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep. Just like my father knows me and I know him, in this knowing relationship, there's a great love. In such a way, I am good shepherd and I know my sheep. And my sheep knows me. And also, it declares in Psalm 100, 100 verse 3, it says, Know that the Lord, He is God. He is, it is He who has made us. And not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Our desire to know him, it takes more than cognitive ways. It's by experiencing his goodness and his nature and inviting his nature into my personal life. There are many attributes of God, but one standing in my life, and I exercise it, and I invite it, and I embrace it. And as I walk with him, and I begin to understand who he is. Recently, a certain person encouraged me to read a book. The title is Quality of a Spiritual War Warrior by Graham Cook. And I want to just, instead of paraphrasing it, because it's so beautifully stated, because he began to know a certain area of God's nature and embodied it into his own life and exercised it and how it transformed his life. And that's in a way of knowing God. And he described it in this way. He said, for me, it is the kindness of God that is one of God's attributes. He is the kindest person I have ever known. His loving kindness has overwhelmed my heart, and my life now for many, many years. It has changed my character. It has upgraded my personality. It has radically altered my behavior. Loving kindness is my own personal highway into the presence of the Lord. It dominates my thinking, overrules my perceptions, and maintains my heart in a place of joy, warmth, and rest. This is one way of beginning to know him, to enjoy his love. For me, one area of his attribute is his holiness. The more I engage and pursue his holiness, I am awe-stricken how awesome he is. His holiness beautifies his nature and reveals his glory through the channel of his holiness and I want to dwell in his presence and I do not want to allow any drop of filthiness into my heart, into my life because I am addicted to his presence. And the more I pursue after his holiness, the more I begin to know him and fully be able to understand how he loves me and loves me so. And another attribute is a patient. How long-suffering he is. And as we 
and I myself exercise the patience in me and towards other people, wait, wait, and be patient with a certain individual, then I realize how patient my God has me thus far, and he will be continually. And in that patience, I understand agonizing, grievous love, which is absurd, how he does not change his mind of loving me, how many times I fall, how many times I reject him, how many times I grieve him. His love is unchanging because he's a patient. And that's how we know him. Putting all the energy, all the passion, all knowledge, all my soul, all my time, all my resources to know him and know his love. Perhaps that's why as a husband of his church, he was able to say to all men in the first Colossians chapter 3, verse 7, likewise, men, dwell with your wives according to knowledge. Because men and women are so created differently. Men, you need to exercise your intelligence to know and study your wife. Yes, it's a good thing that you remember wedding anniversary and what color she likes and what shoe size she has. I realize for women, these are important. But more so than making yourself available, how emotionally she struggles there and how much she feels lonely and making myself available to her and be on her side. And it takes efforts, and that's knowing her and dwelling with her according to knowledge. Because our husband understands that because he knows me. He knows me so much. And as we try to understand his love, His desire is towards me. Sometimes I cannot fully comprehend how my God, who is so awesome, who is so universal, who is so powerful, and who has so many, many people to love, but his desire is so exclusive toward me. That's quite difficult to understand. But as a husband, I had an occasion to understand his passion to a little degree. About three years ago, I went to India for mission. When I go to mission, I'm fully preoccupied with the ministry. And I don't miss my wife, my children. Sorry, my son. <laughs> but immediately, mission is over. I begin to miss my wife so much. And about three years ago, I've been married already for over 10 years. And I wanted to stop by in Korea because of my in-laws and pay a visitation. And I was scheduled to stay there for a couple of nights. But first night, I was burning with a desire for my wife. My passion, my desire, I missed my wife so much. And I thought I was becoming crazy. And I said to myself, did I eat too much curry when I was in India? You know, because Indian people use so much of herb in their food, maybe one of these herbs was love potion or something has happened in me. And there was a photo of my wife from college years in that room that I was sleeping. And she looked so pretty and so beautiful. And I took a photo of it and I cackled her to my wife, I miss you so much. And I couldn't stand it anymore. And I had to change my flight and came to America a day earlier. And my in-laws were very disappointed. And to this day, they don't know why I had to return back to America. And during those days, you know what I did? I wrote a poem to my wife. I never wrote a poem to my wife even during dating. So I brought this poem to my wife as I was returning back and eagerly excited to see her and gave her poem. You know what my wife said? What's up with this? <laughs> you never wrote me a poem during dating. <laughs> you know, it's so difficult as a couples.
to be same romantically emotional towards each other. <laughs> it's a very challenging. But my God, His desire, His passion is not random. It's a perpetual. It's a consistent. And it's a faithful. And it's always, always His desire is toward me. And to this desire, to this love, my only response is to give my entire being. It's so despisable if I say, God, I give you hour a day in meditating your word in my prayer. It's so despisable when he gave all of his being to me. Because his love, he said, I am the good shepherd. John 10, 11, the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. John 15, 13, greater love has no one that needs that to lay down one's life for his friends. You know, his love is so absurd in a way. When we go back to the cross, this love, is so radical, so absurd, so consumable, so crazy at the cross. There's no fairness. At the cross, there's no justice. You know why? As a Christ, as a son of God, who is a perfectly God, who is a perfectly holy, who is a perfectly righteous, and he hangs on the cross, and bleeds. What an injustice. This innocent man be crucified for the wretched people like you and I, for the sinners like you and I, to pay the penalty. This innocent man, holy God, perfect creator, will be hung on the cross and will die for that. What an injustice. Are we talking about fairness? We get offended when we are treated unfairly. But talking about Jesus on the cross, where is the fairness? If it is a fairness, he shouldn't die on the cross. Because it is a fair for us to die and be doomed eternally in hell. But what an unfairness and unfair treatment goes to Jesus that he will sacrifice his own life for me for such evil men like me and this is absurd love why because love bypasses everything even against his own nature because our god is a god of justice but because his love is overwhelming and overrides everything even his nature of fairness and justice and bypasses everything and that's how strong his love and his desire is toward me. And it would be absurd to say, I gave you this much of offering. I gave you this much of time every day. And where is the balance in my life? It would be absurd expression and offensive to my God when he violated his own nature to love me on that cross. I want to conclude this message with a psalm, chapter 8, from verses 6 through 7. Here it says, Send me as a seal upon your heart, as a seal upon your arm, for love is as strong as death, jealousy as a cruel as the grave. Its flames are flames of fire, a most vehement flame. Many waters cannot quench the love, nor can the floods drown it. If a man would give for love all the wealth of his house, he will be utterly despised. Even though what we possess, what we accomplish, what we have, we pull them down for this love, it will be still utterly despised. He gave his life against his own nature. And this absurd love, a cruel love, and this love 
is as strong as a death. Because death expressed how much he loved us. Let us all rise. His desire, his heart, his love for me is so crazy, so consuming. And he desires to seize me, possess me, own me, and set my heart on the flame. He's so relentless. He is so restless to pursue my heart. His desire is unstoppable. And to him, I give my soul. I give my heart. God, you are my reason to live. You are my purpose. You are my breath. You are my everything. You are my reason. You are my, it's undescribable. As I begin to dwell in your love. Show me, Lord. Show your love in my own tongue so that I may comprehend. So that I may grasp and uphold and feel it. In your private chamber, lead me, invite me, Lord. Today, instead of crying out to God, How about we walk into his private chamber and listen to his heartbeat and feel his flame and understand his obsession with me. How is it that I am like his idol? He will let his only son walk through the flame of crucifixion to own me. God, I am yours, and you are mine. I am yours. Have me, own me, seize me, consume me, flame me, so that no ash may be left over. My heart to be totally burnt up. Nothing, no more to consume. 